Good morning. Well, we're launching into a new series. Um, we've just got completed our values and principles. And so we're looking at First Peter. And this is going to be a 30,000 feet look, of course, because we're only going to do one chapter each time. Or we, we will be doing a whole chapter rather each time. So it's going to be a five part series, which means I can't go into lots of detail, but I can give you the big picture. And that's what I plan to do. And um, it's good for us to just get the picture of what a chapter looks like and just to zoom into that. And I'm going to pull out my favorite bits in just a moment. But just an overview, first of all, let me show you this. They have the, um, uh, this is my little personal outline of the book. And it really, you know, me and my alliteration, I can't help myself. Uh, salvation, submission, and suffering. But I'm not, I don't think any of them are forced. I can pr pretty well promise you that. They all make a lot of sense because uh, we're talking about our great salvation and what does that entail? And that's the foundation uh, of, of, and the superstructure then is built upon it is how we live and how we respond to adversity. Remember, I've told you before, suffering right here. This is one of the four things that God uses in your spiritual walk and growth. You will not grow into conformity with Christ without it. You cannot possibly do it. It's needful. So I'm just zooming into that. So you have your salvation. And then as you submit, but the, the two of these, there's a kind of a reciprocal relationship, I suppose I could say, because um, if I look at it from this vantage point here, you could say that they, these two reinforce each other. You see, this is the foundation. Now you've been saved. You've come to that knowledge. But now you're in a process of sanctification where you're becoming in your practice who you already are in your position. So you're living out that life. And in that process, these have a reciprocal relationship because adversity will bring you to submission, which then will enhance your capacity to receive more Christ-likeness, which means you will be more conformed to his image because you're shaped by suffering. And so that concept is, is really what I'm uh, trying to stress here. And these three, four areas rather of submission are, are as a citizen, as a worker, in the sphere of marriage, and in the sphere of church. And those are, in fact, the four realms of divinely given authority that he's mandated. So you have government, we have work, we have the family, we have the church. Those are the four mandated areas of divine authority. And each of them has their, its own sphere of authority. But then I zoom in in particular to chapter 3, 13 to 5, 11, which really particularly and overtly clearly underscores the nature of suffering and what you're going to be needing. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. You see what he's saying? Don't be surprised. You were, you were here because we're being conformed to his image. So the other three things, the word of God and prayer and fellowship are also needful in our growth in Christ. But this is also going to be the thing that will bring you into conformity with the image of his suffering, being conformed to his death, being shaped by that, so that we become like him because we will not actually grow into a, 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 a conscious need for him apart from adversity. Again, the Lewisism that I quote so often, God whispers to us in our pleasures. What's the next part? He speaks to us where? In our conscience. But then where does he shout to us? In our pain. Because it's, it's God's megaphone to rouse the deaf world. So you can't avoid that. But remember what I say. If you're smart, you'll listen to the whispers. If you're smart, you'll thank him for the pleasures of life. And that will amplify your gratitude and contentment. We see most people wait too long for more severe methods because he will get your attention. Yes. If one way or another, you can, you, can, you can do it easy, you can do it hard. You're going to pay me now, you can pay me later, you see. Yeah. So it's wise then to submit to that because it's not that it's going to be painless, but it'll be a greater process of joy, growth, and um, integrity in your own journey as you learn to hear the prompts of the Spirit, submit to the, to the process he's taking you through, knowing that he's going to redeem what he allows, and that it's necessary. Remember the idea that restoration requires wreckage. 
And so you can't build and improve until you break a thing down. Now you're ready to do this one. Now you're ready to do that. You know what it's like, the analogy with a house and a particular bathroom or whatever, or kitchen. You're going to have to tear it up before you can make it right. And you have to have a blueprint every time. And God, God always has a blueprint, doesn't he? Just as he has a blueprint in his word, he has a blueprint in your life because he's going to apply the word to your unique situation in a way that no one else will need. And it's going to be specific because the spirit of God works in you and through you as you. And so he manifests the life of Christ in you. And he is now your one to actually go to as I constantly going back and forth, trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit, abide in the Son, trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit, abide, uh, walk by, you see how it goes back and forth because it's my relationship with the Father to trust him, you see. It's my relationship with the Son to walk and abide in him, to draw my life from his life. It's my relationship with the Spirit to keep in step, to walk by the Spirit. So as I'm bringing that all to bear, then it's going to relate to this. So persecution is going to produce a response. Either you're going to grow or you're going to get worse. You're either going to get better or you're going to get bitter when you go through persecution. And so we know that that's, uh, he's, 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 he's warning them because of the, uh, it's need for you to correct, conduct yourselves uh, correct, courageously, being above reproach and imitating the one who actually suffered on your behalf as well, because you're going to be following in his footsteps, participating in those, in those adversities. Um, submission, as I say, to government, to masters, to husbands, wives, to one another. So the various fears of that. Uh, don't be surprised, think, as I said here, verse 412 is a great summary. There's a fiery trial. Every one of the five chapters alludes to adversity and suffering. So therefore, it's been called the Job of the New Testament and for good reason. And it particularly zooms in there. But my favorite verse of all is in chapter 5, because there it summarizes the entire message of the epistle. After you have suffered for a little Wow. Isn't that an amazing statement? Two things. Didn't say if. <laughs> he said after, which means that suffering is not an elective in the university of life. It's a required course. After you have suffered, but how long is it going to be? A little while. It's going to be like that. And the older I get, the quicker the years go by. But the amazing thing is that my memories of the past, the, 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 and I know the memory is selective, we choose, but, but they're as vivid uh, ones I've had 50 years ago as ones I had five minutes ago in some, in some strange, bizarre way. But I can recognize those patterns, and, sit and, and I've been here long enough to see, oh, this has happened before. There are certain things you begin to see that occur. And if you're wise, you're going to gain skill by watching certain patterns and behaviors and so forth and experiences in your life, and you gain a skill and an acuity through, through wisdom, and so that we learn from that. So this is an epistle that gives us that understanding. After you've suffered for a little while, the, how, the amount of time is brief and ephemeral. Your life on this world, my, my existence in this world is like, it's, it, it was like a moment. That's why I now tell an audience, if I'm with people who are about 30 years old, I say, you'll be like me in 15 minutes. And it sounds odd, but 15 minutes is like that. It's like 50 years. Strangest thing, isn't it? But what that sort of divine de de desiring uh, us to know is that we're our life on this earth you may have 100 years. It'll be just such a moment, and you're going to see it as such. And it's going to become more and more dim in your memory. And you, all the things you fretted about and worried about and feared, take the thousand-year view. Will this thing matter in a thousand years? That's a wise perspective right now. Things that you're, ooh, this was, stop whining and worrying and wondering. How's, that's a third W. But instead, what you want to do is you want to actually get that long-term perspective. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's the essence of this book. You people were called out of darkness 
You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And their former aimless conduct received by the traditions from their fathers. They were maligned by their country. And, but he also ministered to, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. But a lot of these people that he's addressing were scattered. It was a kind of a dispersion, a diaspora that took place, uh, especially because of adversity around the various provinces of, of the Roman Empire. And he specifically mentions those, those locations there. And so growing opposition is going to happen. You're going to be reviled. You're going to be abused. It hasn't yet been officially banned in Rome. This is before the neuronic uh, per persecutions in 64, uh, but it's pretty soon. And so you can anticipate what's happening. And P Peter himself, a man who was dramatically changed, the Peter of the Gospels and the Peter of Acts is a different man in many ways, uh, because he's, it's the pre and post resurrection Peter and all the difference in the world that that made. But at any rate, it was, Peter was crucified before Nero's death, we know, in 68, uh, written from uh, figure de description Babylon of Rome um, and mentions Mark. And it was written before the outbreak of persecution under Nero in AD 64. So it just gives you enough of a perspective, and that's all I'm going to do. Now I'm going to go into the text. So giving you that overview, though, I want to just get a big, big, big overview of the book, and now we zoom down. So he calls himself a sent one, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens. And he mentions these, these places I just showed you. You're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. You notice the Trinitarian motif right there. So you have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son right there. And you, so he's showing the richness of the participation of the divine trinity in your life and, and, uh, and purposes. And that grace and peace, which is, of course, the key to having peace is grace. You can't have shalom without God's grace, without God's um, redemption and bringing us into peace with him. So he then starts off with this doc doxology, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, how many of your hopes have died? There are many dead hopes, aren't there? Many hopes, most things that men hope in, there'll be ashes in their mouth. This is a living hope that you've been called to, one that transcends the seasons and circumstances of this brief life and invites us into a hope that will be secure and sustainable and will never diminish. And here's how he describes it. Four things about this inheritance you're going to be receiving. It's first of all imperishable. Secondly, it's undefiled. It can't be corrupted in any manner. And third, it will not diminish. How many times have you bought a thing and you thought your joy was dependent upon it as soon as you, you, you drove it off the lot or, 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 or signed the contract in the house, whatever it was? <laughs> it's not all it was cracked up to be. And you're already thinking of something else. It's amazing how that works. But here is something that's not going to fade. It's not going to diminish. In fact, if anything, I think it's, the joy will only continue to increase. You're not going to be sitting around wondering if there are any magazines here. You see, and um, it's reserved. It's the third third thing. Um, it's it's um, it's well, it's imperishable, undefiled. Third, it won't fade away. And fourth, it's reserved. You got a reserved seat. Your name is on it. You see, you at the banquet of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and the at the wedding feast, and at the, all those places, uh, all the table fellowship that's alluded to from Genesis to Revelation. You got a, a, a place. You are not an outsider. You are, are going to be at the table, at the high table. I like that idea. The high table, in in Oxford, they 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 have the high table in each of the colleges, and then the the rather regular tables as well. You're going to be at the high table, and you'll have a place with it. What'll that be like? The metaphor, the imagery of fellowship around table, and that's really a beautiful picture, isn't it? Of how good it is for people to enjoy the gifts of God, and and actually hear the whispers of His pleasure in a collective whole and to re memorialize that and to enjoy it now as hints of home, because the best goods that you've ever known or received are all merely hints of greater goods that you cannot yet name, but they'll be better than you can name, but you won't be disappointed, I promise you that. So when you look back on this earth, you'll realize, I wish I'd known. 
It was far better than I thought. If I'd only known, I would have done, I would have lived differently maybe. Well, why don't you understand, have that perspective now so you will live differently. So you will not, you'll live in such a way that you won't be disappointed. You see, you want to live with an expectant hope and a confident assurance in the purposes of God. This thing on four fears. I believe I shared this with you, but I want to share it. I just felt prompted because these are fears that people are wrestling with and, and tormented by. And most men fear these four in one way or another. All their lives, there many, many people have known rejection and it still it haunts them, which then relates to failure, a, a feeling that you're not going to achieve, the feel, feeling that you're not going to be uh, have en enough to make it, who can say in an uncertain world. And then, of course, the fear of dying and my four face or um, moving from rejection to acceptance by the Father because he adopted you into his family. That's a deliberate act. That you are not re rejected and you're not a failure because he's been given you all that you need for life and righteousness and, and the Holy Spirit. He's packed your bags. He's given you what you need. Third, you don't have to fear poverty because God's the one who's going to provide for you out of his riches and glory according to what you need. And th fourth, the fear of dying is overcome by the resurrected life of Christ. I mentioned these four things because in association with these promises that we now have something that's certain and assured and reserved in heaven for us. Because you're protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And I love this next text. And he says, in this you greatly rejoice, even, thou, even though now for a little while, Notice, after you've suffered for a little while, he says it here also. That was in 510, he was going to say it. You've been distressed by various trials. So, but he, notice how he contextualizes. It's just, they're, they're small and they're temporary compared with the glory to be revealed, you see. And they're needful. Even those trials will turn out to have been redemptive because they will bring about the kind of qualities that you need, because if everything goes your way, you'll stop growing. You'll become mediocre, you'll become self-satisfied, and you will not actually continue to press on to the higher things of God. So he continues to um, push us forward and draw us forward. So the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is test perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that even this idea of the trials is going to be a proof that's going to produce gold. It's, it's, it's going to be something that is tested by fire. And of course, the hotter the fire, the more purified the metal becomes. And so there's a whole that, that whole concept as well. And though you have not seen him, you love him. This is a wonderful text. Now, Peter has seen him. But he knows that most of his readers never have seen him, but they will see him. But Peter was privileged of having the, uh, the, the time uh, with the resurrected Christ. He, as I said before, he's a different man after the resurrection than he is before the resurrection. I wonder if he looked back in his life and wondered how many wasted moments he'd had where he could have been walking more with Jesus and asking him more full questions. I wonder about that. Yeah, when did he ever look back and wonder, gosh, I wish I had done that. But he who was in his presence, and I think few of the disciples, other than perhaps John, who always seemed to be at his right side, the, the one whom Jesus loved because he was the one who was always hanging around with Jesus. So he, there was a connection there. I wonder if he wonders if he shouldn't have been hanging with Jesus a little bit more. I don't know, but he was privileged though, even have a glimpse of the one who's to, to, to whom to see is to look at infinity and eternity incarnate. Now imagine looking in those eyes. It's scary when you think about what that'd be like. But it's wonderful as well. So you can see this, uh, though you haven't seen him, you can still love him, can't you? And that's a wonderful thought. So wait till you see him. You see, then it'll be the fulfillment of, of all longings and all desire. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, he says, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, 
obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul, so that there's a, in, in the spite of the trials and the adversities, there can be a sense of joy which transcends the circumstances of life. That's why, as I said before, joy is a choice. Gratitude is a choice. Contentment is a choice. These are choices. They're not just the way you respond to your environment. It's the way, who, it's who you are. So you have, if you are a person of dignity and of destiny, and you have a different derivation as well, you have been given a new spiritual DNA in Christ in your past because you were adopted in his family. You're no longer in the line of Adam, but you're in the line of Christ, which is a line that has no beginning and no end. And now you have not only this new derivation, but you have this new dignity in this present tense. You are a child of the king. And furthermore, you're an inheritor, so you have this destiny that's beyond imagination, that transcends really the best things we can do because our imaginations are too thin. We don't have enough. We can't fully get it. But you can again be assured you won't be disappointed. But even now, you can rejoice with joy. Wait till you see it then. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. So the prophets, because again, in the, the law came through Moses, grace and truth were revealed uh, in Jesus Christ. And so when you go through the Old Testament and you see the sacrificial system and the, the law and all that's entailed in that, it's really, in my mind, a kind of a bloody mess. And it, but it's anticipatory, the tabernacle and all the ceremonies, the garments, Everything about it, the, the, the um, uh, feasts themselves, everything was a pointer to Christ because the old is in the new revealed, the new is in the old concealed. It was there, but they couldn't, it was there, but it wasn't there. They couldn't see it. We can look back and, oh, this was all about him, you see, because they could have never dreamed that the one who would be the suffering servant would also be the one who'd be the reigning king. They could never, never put that together. Who would dream or imagine or conceive that the infinite word would become the incarnate word. Who could, who could even dream that? The, one, the infinite one who made all that is now, uh, became human, fully human with undiminished deity. And he came for that purpose, not because he came to rule and to reign, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then he will rule and reign because the cross precedes the crown. And so it is in your life as well that adversity will proceed and humility will precede honor. So you humble yourself in this life and you will be honored in the next. And so there, that God honors those who honor him. So there's a principle here because he's wired you for profit and gain. There's nothing wrong with seeking profit. We were wired for, for gain. You're gonna give your life this day in exchange for something. What's it, what's it gonna be in exchange for? And so you're pursuing gain, just make sure that what you call gain is what God calls gain and not what the earth calls gain. That's the difference. So that you have to treasure the things that he calls to be valuable. Otherwise, you're not gonna treat things according to their true value and then you act like a fool. You treasure the temporal and hold the eternal as something you can put off until later which is a terrible mistake. So it was revealed to them though, that they, they were wanted to know, it's interesting here, the prophets wanted to know about this person or time, that the spirit of Christ within them, because he was indicating that, they knew this much, that they're, t that they're revealing, that they're given something more than they can understand or apprehend. And it was for you and me, we are privileged to see what they couldn't have even dreamed about now. You see, in the access to the New Testament, we've been given this great, so you need to treasure this book for what it is. It's a great gift. And it, it's the blueprint, it's the thing that gives you life. The night of my conversion, that was the metaphor that came to me. This is God's blueprint for living. I gotta find out what it means, what it, tell, what it see, te teaches. That's what had happened. So it was, but they, it was revealed to these prophets that they weren't serving themselves, but you in these things which have been preached, who uh, are pronounced to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent to he from heaven. They preached the gospel even before they knew the fullness of the gospel. 
These were men who were saved by grace through faith. It was not different in the New Testament than in the Old. It was, uh, it's, remember, the basis of salvation has always been the death of Christ. The means of salvation has always been grace through faith. But the object of that faith, the content, is, is increasing with the progress of revelation. Angels long to look into these things because they don't have any understanding of, about the idea of a creating beings that will be above the angels. And, they will, and because even now, the angels, it tells us, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for those who will inherit salvation? The angels are serving you. And if you saw an angel manifest, you'd be on your face. What do you think you're going to be like? pretty nice thought you see you're looking at uh, the idea of gods and goddesses as lewis would put it that you never met a mere mortal and everybody has great dignity and therefore a great weight you see and so he says these are things we've and so keep the, the application prepare your minds for action keep sober in spirit fix your hope completely on the grace to be wrought, be wrought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't put your hope in the things of this world, but rather fix your hope on that grace that will be revealed. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. It is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So we go back to the holiness of God. But only God can actually make it possible for us to attain that holiness, and it's his grace gift. So if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. It's an interesting statement. There's little that we hear about the fear of God in our times, and that's a terrible blunder. We should hear more and think more about the fear of God because there's a fear of love of God and a love of God, and they're two sides of the same coin, if you really understand them. Conduct yourselves in fear, a holy fear, and during the time of your brief uh, sojourn in this world. You aren't redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. You were purchased with precious blood. That's what you're worth. As of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But he's appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Isn't this a great summary of these spiritual truths, that all this is about what was revealed in the prophets, and then he, then he makes his application. Since you've purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So what begins with the love of God ends with the love of neighbor once again. And that's why that component of word, the word of God in prayer and the neighbor, the, the neighbor love, the idea of fellowship of believers is critical uh, for their growth. And then there's the suffering. So they all go together. You've been born again with this seed, which is imperishable, the living and enduring word of God. All flesh is like grass. He's quoting Psalm 103 and the glory of the, and, but the, but the Lord, word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word which was preached to you. So you are a product of that living word, which is an amazing thought. So kind of put together and think about the book as a whole, um, how your salvation will be manifested in your submission. You're gonna re-manifest that and then, but what role, the role of suffering that will play that God will use in your life. So can chew on those things a little bit. What emerged from your, from your converse today? What was your conversation? Two weeks ago today, um, my 30 year old nephew was killed in a car wreck in Wilmington, North Carolina. As I sat with my sister last week and her just wailing weeping, why, you know, hurting to the deep depths of her soul. Um, God just reminded me, the Lord is near the broken heart and he saved those crushed in spirit. <clears throat> and the reminder was is that I couldn't do that. Only God saves those who were broken hearted. We spend so much of our life trying to fix grief, fix suffering, fix it. And God's the one who does the fixing. God's the one who does the healing. God's the one who's the near. We can hold them, we can be there, we can say things, but 4,000 words of advice doesn't fix what a, ho what a holy God can do. <clears throat> and as I told her, I said, if there's <clears throat> anybody who understands what it's like to lose a son, it's the Heavenly Father. There's, he's going to hold word. you and he's not letting you go. Mm -hmm. so. That's a good word. Um, and that was a, yeah. Often we say the foolish, most foolish things when people are gr grieving and suffering. We say foolish platitudes 
But that was a good invitation there, and that was a wise thing to do. And the, often the best thing is, is when a person is grieving to be there for them and not try to answer, their, answer why, but just to em, em, commiserate with feel and um, embrace and love and, uh, and receive. But that's a good word that, that you gave her. There was a secular song once, I think Lynn Anderson sang this, he said, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Mm. Mm -hmm. Many Christians today think that God, if you just come to him, I was thinking on the way into this morning, I was thinking about that. We have a tendency to think about all the blessings God gives us, but sometimes he calls us to suffering. Yeah. In fact, he told Paul, I have chosen you to suffer for my sake. That's exactly right. And it's I a chosen believe, vessel of mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. And even today, I believe there's a ministry of martyrdom. We don't want to talk about that. You don't hear lessons or sermons about it because you empty your church, and your classrooms. Yes. We need to know that there is times where God is going to choose certain people to be used for his glory that may cost you even your life. I mean, it's, it's quite so. Um, and when you think about the, um, in uh, uh, Matthew 5, um, and when we think about the Beatitudes, um, when you think about the poor, and I mean, if, you, if, if I were going to do a seminar, here's how you can, too can be poor in spirit, how you can ha learn how to mourn, learn how to be uh, gentle, how to be hunger and thirst for righteousness, how to be merciful, how to be pure in heart, how to be peacemakers, and also how you can be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. How many want to sign up? <laughs> Instead, if you took just the opposites of these components and put a Christian veneer on it, it would be very popular. In fact, it's being done. You see, so this is not what people want. But he didn't call you to comfort. He calls you uh, to know him. And he's much more concerned about your character than he is about your comfort. Much more concerned about your holiness than about your happiness. He didn't call you to be happy, he called you to be holy. He called you to be a man of, or of character, not a man who just of convenience. And that's a big high thing and it, you, there's a price to be paid. And it's the cost of discipleship. You, the more serious you get, the higher the cost. There's a price to be paid. You're not going to know him in a cavalier, casual manner. There's going to be a rather a, a measure of commitment, won't it be? A measure of of uh, of um, brokenness, a measure of 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 um, surrender, brokenness, um, and then you find your true life by losing your life and finding it in him. Remember the net gain. He never calls us to a net loss. When he tells you that you will suffer, it's because you're going to have a better good than you would have gained by pursuing the wealth, wealth of this world, a far better good. That'll be, you'll see it for what it is. Then you'll see it for the ashes it was and the, tr the tinsel it was. You'll see it for its true self. But he tells you to be rejoice when you share that adversity because then you are people who are manifesting the age to come, even in this darkness. That's a lovely thought. There was another. I think if we just follow his example, <clears throat> he came to serve. And if, if we take the example out of your book, Leadership in the Image of God, and spend our time serving in all aspects, in all walks of our life, we're going to live a very exciting, very happy life. It's, it's just incredible. Yes, that's a good, that's a good word. Because you're, dealing, you're now being called to a, a form of leadership that um, really illustrates what um, it means. The perspective of a leader, we've done this before, is, uh, is that he's a steward. He doesn't own anything. He's managing the resources of another. His, 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 the people of a leader, uh, that, I mean, that he's a, he's a shepherd. He's a steward. That's his perspective. He's a shepherd. You're not called to be, be about yourself, you're, but about the Father's business of shepherding, guiding, feeding, and protecting others. And you're a servant, so that's how you practice it. We're all, your perspective, it's God's, you've, you're the people God's going to embed in your life, but then you know you're all called to put it into practice, and that means to serve. Everyone likes to be called a servant. A servant. But no one likes to be treated as one. You know, if, and if we serve like like that, we can't lose. We just can't lose. And and if 
if somebody didn't come along with you, Jesus will take care of it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So it's, it's living a guided life. And one of the things that I was stressing with, with my group here um, was this, I'm going back and forth in this now. It's been an interesting thing. It's the, the, the Trinitarian nature of this. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, sometimes I'll start by walk by the Spirit and then abide in the Son and, and trust in the Father. And then I'm going to abide in the Son and walk by the Spirit. And back and forth, what it does is it reminds me of the personal connection I have with each of the persons of the divine uh, Godhead who also is to be treated and seen as one as well as many. It's a deep mystery. And so uh, my approach to God, though, is triune in this manner. But it, training yourself to really hear the prompts of the Spirit is a training exercise you want to be doing and uh, so that you can really uh, hear. And the way you amplify your hearing capacity is obedience. So when you are invited to do a thing, even if it's a small interruption, you pick up more and more discerning the prompts of the spirit. You're walking in the spirit, you see, and then, and in so far as you're doing that, you're also abiding in the sun. You're drawing your vitality from him. You're not creating life. You never could, you can't create life. You can receive it and display it, but you can't create it. He does it in you and through you as you. And then as you're trusting in the father, because it's all a matter of trusting in what he, because he redeems what he allows. So it's a mindset with, it's a, it's a winner's mindset. In the end of the day, he's called you to be gain, to gain, net gain. Treasures, portfolio in heaven, using temporal good for eternal wealth. Ah, oh, that's not a bad subtitle for a book. <laughs> that's, that's the subtitle of my book, Leverage. Using temporal, uh, temporal goods for eternal wealth, you see. Temporal wealth for eternal good, rather. I had it wrong. Tempor uh, temporal wealth for eternal good. You're, you're leveraging it. That's what you're called. You're, you're called in this world to leverage what God's given you and make it a multiplier by the Spirit of God. And he can amplify what you do. But as you let him uh, do it and train yourself by becoming more spring-loaded to promptings of the Spirit.